I'd like to personally thank you for tuning in to this broadcast. At Highview Baptist Church, we exist to lead people to know and follow Jesus. We're so thankful that you're taking the time to dig into God's Word with us. And we'd encourage you to check Highview out more on our website at highview.org. We hope and pray that the Lord is speaking to you in and through His Word and that you truly will come to know and follow Jesus. Church family, grab your Bible, turn it back into Exodus, Exodus chapter 15, 15. As I mentioned, the last couple of weeks, we've been in some of the most monumental moments of all biblical history, especially for the Old Testament. Number one, in Exodus chapter 12, you have, of course, the Passover and God's judgment upon the firstborn in Egypt, the liberation of the people. They plunder the Egyptians. God gives them favor They're driven out and then, of course, God places them by the Red Sea where they find themselves with nowhere to go. But God, again, in this great miracle, splits the sea, drives them across, and then brings judgment upon the Egyptian army. And with all these miracles that he has done, it's honestly really surprising, at least if we're reading it in in our own human reason, it's surprising but so instructive where he takes them next. All of this deliverance, all of this redemption, liberation to take them into the wilderness. For what purpose? At the turn of the fifth century, there was a man named Patrick, a young man. He was about 16 years old, born into a wealthy family, really had a good life set up ahead of him, at least from any worldly standards. He lived in, at that time, Roman-controlled Britain until when he was 16 years old. Irish pirates came and captured him and took him back to the country of Ireland, where for the next six years, Patrick would work as a slave under this great oppression of these people. If you're wondering what Patrick I'm talking about, I'm talking about who we know as St. Patrick, St. Patrick's Day. Patrick, who God would eventually use to spread the gospel in such a way that's one of the greatest gospel movements, movements of the Holy Spirit in all of history as the gospel spread across the nation of Ireland. But where did it begin? It began in a moment of wilderness for Patrick. I wanna read you this quote about Patrick's life. It's up on the screen. Speaking of a slavery, it says, for the next six years, Patrick lived the homely and hard life of a slave, working as a shepherd. Isolation and cold brought him misery and misery taught him humility. God worked powerfully in Patrick's suffering to remake him from the inside out. He rescued Patrick from himself and made his heart captive to the love of Christ. Before his abduction, he did not believe in the living God. As a slave, Patrick came to see the hand of God and he faced his unbelief and pride. He became aware of God's protection and he discovered that God loved him as a father loves his son. In God's grace and his love for us, there are certain things that you can only learn in the wilderness, but we need to know how to learn them, how in humility to respond to him that he might truly work in us holiness and a trust in his character. Would you stand with me? We'll read here to begin in Exodus chapter 15. After the song of Moses, starting in verse 22, it's the very next thing that happens. I want you to think about this. There's this great deliverance that has just taken place. They've had probably the best worship service in human history up to this point. But it's amazing how forgetful we can be. Exodus 15, verse 22. Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. And the people grumbled against Moses saying, what shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord and the Lord showed him a log and he threw it into the water and the water became sweet. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule and there he tested them saying, if you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do that which is right in his eyes and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians for I am the Lord your healer. And they came to Elam where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees and they encamped there by the water. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we need to know today 
that you are sufficient, that your word is sufficient, that we need not fear, for you will not forsake those whom you have purchased. So Lord, I pray by the power of your spirit today that we would not be forgetful, but God, in the midst of our greatest distress, you would work the greatest moments of power and sweetness that we've ever experienced because we trust in you. And I pray it, Jesus, in your name, amen. You may be seated. This is Wilderness 101, okay? So you might think that they were led into this wilderness moment and this distress once, but it doesn't happen one time. It doesn't happen two times in these three chapters. It happens three times between chapter 15 and chapter 17. Wilderness 101, that's what we need to talk about today. And I wanna bring out three elements across these cycles that the people of Israel experience, cycles that we experience in our own lives. Number one, we need to know the purpose of the wilderness. We need to know the path of the wilderness. And then we need to know the true provision in the wilderness. And we'll go at it in that order. But let's first talk about the purpose. Go back with me in chapter 15, Verse 22, look at it again. Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea. They went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And it's in that place told in verse 23 that they call this place actually on the tail end of this experience, Mara. Because in Hebrew, that simply means bitter or bitterness. And they named this place according to their struggle. Okay, that's not a happy name. That's not a remembrance of some, some happy stuff. This was incredibly difficult. A lot of times when we're thinking about our distress, it's because the Wi-Fi went out or something like that. And a lot of times we don't experience true distress, but first we need to sympathize a bit with their predicament. Three days without water. I, I mean, if y'all know me well, some of y'all laugh. I don't like to go like 10 minutes without water. I mean, you want to hydrate or dihydrate. You know what I'm saying? They, three days. If you have small children, you're starting to panic. You're starting to freak out about what's going on, but so imperative here and at every subsequent moment of this, you have to remember this, Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea. Why? Because God made them set out from the Red Sea. God, through the pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day, we know he is leading them. He has ordered them out into this wilderness. The Lord has placed them in this position where they are without water. But look what it does, verse 24. Verse 24. The people grumbled against Moses. Immediately coming out of their heart is this sin, this blame shifting, this complaining, this grumbling. Ultimately, what is it at its very core? It's unbelief. It's a distrust in the Lord that he's not gonna provide for us. They grumble against Moses. What shall we drink? But then of course you see Moses intercedes. He does the thing that all of them should have, do, should have done. He cries out, he cries to the Lord. The Lord showed him a log, he threw it into the water and the water became sweet. God takes this water that's not potable, that's likely poisonous, that they can't drink and he not only makes it so that they are able to drink it, but he makes it sweet. There's not just something literal happening here. There's something shown to us that is true of those who trust in Christ and his provision. He's always going to provide for his people. But this moment is so important. This little cycle that happens. They're brought, led into the wilderness. They're in distress. Moses intercedes and cries out, God provides. What is the purpose of this? That's what we're getting at, right? What's the purpose of the wilderness? Look at the second half of verse 25. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule. And there he tested them. There it is. There he tested them. Maybe you're in a season of wilderness right now. Maybe you're in distress right now. If you're not, you will be. It's not a question of if, it's a matter of when as we follow Christ. All followers of Christ enter into the wilderness because that's what our Lord entered into. What is the purpose of the wilderness? It is the refinement of the people of God. The purpose of the wilderness, just to be very clear, is refinement of the people of God, starting with what? How does refinement begin? Distress brings out what's in your heart. They call the place Mara because it was bitter, but that's not really what was bitter, was it? What was bitter was within them. 
When circumstances are bad, when things go south, when we don't know where things are going to do, where things are going to go, a lot of times what we do is we begin to blame circumstances or like they do, they blame Moses and Aaron. They begin to blame other people and so do we. But circumstances never cause sin. Circumstances reveal sin. Sin is not external to us, sin is internal. And this is what testing does. Testing and distress and pain draws out what's already inside us. And God tests us, not because he doesn't know what's in our hearts, he knows what's in our hearts. But a lot of times until we are tested, we don't know what is in our hearts. But it draws it out and God shows what he wants. In verse 26, he says, if you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do that which is right in his eyes and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians for I am the Lord your healer. What is he doing? What does he want? He wants their holiness. He wants them to listen. He wants to learn from this. If you look over in Moses' commentary, on this whole wilderness experience in Deuteronomy chapter eight, read this with me. Moses said this, you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness. God led them there that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and he let you hunger, and he fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Why do you think Jesus quoted this in the wilderness? The Lord typically has to make us hungry so that we actually can learn what we're truly hungry for. And it's for him. The Lord meets them, however, and tells them, I am the Lord, your healer. And set before them is a name of the Lord that they had not yet known. Many of you probably heard that name, Jehovah Rapha. I'm the Lord, your healer. There are things of God's revelation that apart from testing and apart from the hardest moments of your life, you cannot and will not learn. Of course, none of us want that, but on the other side of it, aren't we glad for it? Are we thankful for it? They know something about God that they did not previously know. What is the purpose of the wilderness? It is to reveal our hearts and to reveal the power and the holiness of God in order that we might be refined to be holy. And we know further that's the purpose because look at verse 27. I think this affirms it. Then they came to Elam where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees and they encamped there by the water. Interesting, in the middle of their distress, God doesn't say, hey, no big deal. Just eight miles that way, there's a paradise. He doesn't tell them. No, because he wants them to know him. What's shown here is the paradise was not that far away, but for their hearts it was. We weren't ready yet. We know across the scripture, God can fix our circumstances with a word. He did it with Peter when he released him from prison. He did it with Joseph when he put him up in second command in Egypt. So if he doesn't, he's doing something in your heart. This is so important. You have to understand the cycle. God leads us at times into distress in order that we would learn dependence, in order that we would know him. You have to know this cycle. God leads us at times into the wilderness, into distress, in order that in crying out, our heart would be revealed. We would see our need for him. We would lean into him. We would cry out to him in order that he would meet us and we would know him like we've never known him before. You have to learn the cycle. But we need to step in in our own hearts and ask some questions. How quickly in difficulty does your heart turn sour? In the moments of wilderness, and maybe you're even in it right now, how do you respond? How do you respond in the midst of difficulty when you feel that God hasn't given you what you think you need or what you want, what's going on, what's happening in your heart? And can you begin to say, wait a minute, I don't need to be asking so much, how can I, as I read from a guy this week, how can I get out of this, but what can I get out of this? What is the Lord doing? What's the purpose? 
We have to spend a lot of time here because this is a struggle to remember. The purpose is the refinement of our hearts and our character to be like Christ. But what's the path? You have to know the path. You can't just know the purpose without the path. You have to know what is the path in the wilderness. Look at chapter 16, verse one. They set out from Elam and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness. How appropriate is this? Of sin. Okay, now in Hebrew, this is just a transliteration of a place. It doesn't really mean sin like disobedience, but it's pretty fitting name, okay? Because that's all that's going on out here in the wilderness is sin. They're in this wilderness of sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, where they were going, where we'll reach in chapter 19. On the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt, You know, how are you feeling when you get out of the paradise? You know, when you get off the mountain, you're feeling pretty good. They were feeling good after the Red Sea, but then it went bad. Then God made the water sweet. Oh, but we got it now. Yeah, we, you know, we doubted him, but we won't do it again. I mean, what were we thinking out there? Man, it's so good. It's easy to say that while you're chilling with the coconuts. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they're in paradise. It's amazing. When things are going well, you're like, yeah, I'm a super Christian. Jehovah Jireh, baby. I'm like, yeah, we're rolling. I'm just feeling the spirit. I'm sensing the spirit until you get hungry, until something negative happens again and what begins to be drawn out. 15th day of the second month. You know, this is 45 days after the Red Sea. 45 days. Not very long at all after he healed the water. It's really easy to look at them and say, what is your deal? Until you realize that we have greater revelation than they did. We have the cross. We have seen God's perfect provision in the blood and death of Christ. We've seen his love displayed perfectly. We know he's alive. We know he was raised from the dead. And how quickly do we forget? It says in verse two, the whole congregation, the people of Israel do what? Grumbled. They sin again against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in Egypt. When we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full, for you brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Doesn't that capture so well what we, maybe what I act like sometimes? We're all gonna die, you know, everything's bad. It's awful, the Lord's abandoned us. He's not gonna, I mean, he can't do, I mean, what can we do? It would be better that we were dead in Egypt it would be better that we were back in Egypt. It's amazing how distress makes you say and do irrational things. Begin to blame people for things that are not their fault. Begin to make you long for things that you never said you wanted to long for again. Let us go back to Egypt. But you know, all of us know in here, you've lived any life at all, you've had moments in your walk with Jesus that have been so hard. You just say, you know what? It would be easier if I wasn't doing this. It'd be easier if I didn't fight this sin. It'd be easier if I didn't do what was right. And you know what? It's right. It would be easier, but it wouldn't be better. It wouldn't be better. No matter how much it might seem, the bread in Egypt's better, that bread is gonna, was gonna kill him. But the Lord said to Moses in verse four, behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven. God's again, I'm gonna provide for you and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them. There it is again. But notice this phrase. This is where I wanna focus this time. Test them to do what? Whether they will walk in my law or not. What's the law? Well, it's the things he's revealing right now. Number one, they shall go out and gather a day's portion every day. We'll get a little more detail on that in a minute. And then also verse five, on the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily because the seventh day was the Sabbath. And so he said, gather twice as much on the sixth day because you're not gonna go out and work on the seventh day. So those are the two things. Gather only as much for the day and gather twice as much on the sixth day because you're not gonna gather on the seventh day. Makes sense? That's their only job, okay? That's it. You think they can do it? Just do that. What is the path? Look again at chapter 15, verse 26. It's very clear here too. If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, do that which is right 
in his eyes. Give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes four times in the same way. God basically says, here's your path in the wilderness, obedience. What is the path in the wilderness? It's obedience to what God has clearly revealed. But but you probably like, like, like me. I don't always like that answer. Because when I don't know what's gonna happen and I think things are going bad and I know what's gonna happen tomorrow and something, I mean, something seems just out of control. I mean, there's disaster striking. What I want are coordinates, don't you? I want coordinates, not commands. That's our struggle. We want GPS, not an ESV. But God's saying, you need the scripture. You don't have to figure out where you're going. You don't know where you're going. And God's probably not gonna tell you where you're going until he leads you there. What is the focus? What is the path in the wilderness? It's very simple, but my goodness, it is so difficult to do. Just do what God said. Look at verse, I believe it's 13. The evening quail came up and covered the camp. In the morning, dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost. Some of y'all wonder, where did that come from? Well, it came from the Bible. Fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? That's where the name manna came from. That's what the phrase in Hebrew sounds like, manna. What is it? They did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded gather of it, each one of you, as much as he can eat, you shall each take an omer. This is a standard of measurement. According to the number of persons that each of you has in his tent. The people of Israel did so. They gathered some more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over. And whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. And Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it over till the morning. That's all they have to do. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning and it bred worms and stank. Moses was angry with them. Then look at verse 27. As to the second part of the command of the Sabbath. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Let no one get out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. It's very simple what the Lord has asked them to do. But even in this moment, they can't seem to do it. This is so, so, so important in all of our lives. We have to learn simple obedience in every moment to the clear commands of God. The path is obedience, always, always. And this isn't just something that you see here in this narrative about the wilderness. I mean, this is painted across the scripture. I just wanna give you a little onslaught of Bible verses about this kind of focus. You know, all the time in the, and when we're thinking about, you know, what's the will of God? What's gonna happen? What we're gonna do? Well, I need wisdom. Well, here's what the Bible says is wisdom. Can you pull up Job 28, 28, these verses? The fear of the Lord, that's wisdom. To turn away from evil, that's understanding. We ask for wisdom, really, the question we need to be asking, am I just turning away from evil? Am I being holy? Psalm 37, four, delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him. You hear that? Commit your way to who? To your pros and cons list? To the Lord. Trust in him. He will act. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. We all know this one. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, know your deep analysis of the situation. Know him. He'll take care of the path. That's what that means. He will make straight the path. Why? Because your path isn't something so much that you're discovering, it's righteousness. And then most importantly, of course, John 14, six, I mean, Jesus drops a bomb when he shows up and says this, I am the way. The way is personal. The way is Jesus, always. It's him. It's saying, Lord, how can I just be obedient? And this is so difficult because we don't think it's gonna work. We don't think it's enough. Maybe you're trying to figure out something with school or a career or job or family or, and you don't know and you're saying, I don't know how this is gonna work. I don't know where this is going in the next six months. 
Here's the kind of question you need to be asking. Just what's going on in my heart? Is this situation causing me to be anxious and stressed and worried? Well, you know what? Those things are sin. What does God want you to do? Turn away from evil. He wants you to do not be anxious, but in everything in prayer and supplication offer it up to him. Is the circumstance causing you to be irritable with your spouse and impatient with your children? Those things are sin. What's he want you to do? Turn away from evil. That's the path. Be obedient to him. Maybe you're just looking at your heart and you don't know. I don't know what to do with this situation, but you have a coworker who sits next to you at work that doesn't know Jesus. What do you think you're supposed to be doing? You say, hold on, Blake, that doesn't. Sharing the gospel when my coworker doesn't have anything to do with this circumstance. It has everything to do with your circumstance because the Lord is not looking at your life as a big jumble of circumstances because you don't even understand those. I don't even understand that anyway. He's sovereign all over that. He is looking to the heart. I have to constantly tell myself this, Blake, stop asking God for clarity in what's unclear when you continue to disregard what he's clearly commanded. Why would God give us insight as to what's unclear when we don't do the things that are clear? We've not been faithful in little. Why would he entrust us to be faithful with much? Luke chapter 16. The path is obedience and maybe, you know, even closest to this text, a kind of obedience that we're all desperate for is related to the very gathering of the manna. God would sustain them each day. How? Through the provision of this manna. And what has God given you every single day that you need to be doing? Disciplined. Every day. Be in the scripture. Read your Bible. Get in Jesus's presence. Abide in Christ. You can't do anything apart from him anyway. You can't live on last week's sermon. You can't live on yesterday's bread. You can't live on what God did in your life 10 years ago. I hear that all the time. Well, you know, we used to do this and we used to do that. I mean, well, great, but what's he doing right now? Like, what does God wanna do in you right now? I'm telling you, he wants to bless you so much with his presence and his joy and his zeal in these moments from his word and his presence, but you have to know him today. The purpose is refinement. The path is obedience. What is the provision? What's the provision? Chapter 17, it says, all the congregation, the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages. According to who led them there? The commandment of the Lord God led them there and they camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. You know, one of the reasons that this same thing keeps happening again and again is because they've not learned yet. That is really critical, isn't it? Maybe you keep finding yourself in the same circumstances that are driving the same reactions again and again and again. When are you going to, in your heart, humble yourself and break the cycle? Because just like any kind of test, you have to pass the test. What's passing the test? Well, it's not you doing so much, it's trusting him. The Lord keeps giving them the same test because they keep failing the same test. They keep having the same sinful reaction. When are we gonna in humility say, Lord, I just wanna be holy this time. I get it, Lord. I just wanna be holy, Lord. Just make me holy. That's it. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses, verse two, and said, give us water to drink. Moses said, why do you quarrel with me? Oh, why do you test the Lord? In the testing of the Lord in our lives for our refinement, We have to be very careful. We don't align ourselves in a position to actually test him. What does it mean to test him? It means to continually have the same kind of disobedient disposition and basically see, you know, I'm gonna wonder if God's gonna do anything about this. Don't test the Lord. You'll lose. You'll lose. Experience his mercy. The people thirsted there for water, verse three. People grumbled against Moses. Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses, praise God, intercedes for them. Aren't you glad we have an intercessor? 
in Christ. They're almost ready to stone me, Moses said. The Lord said to Moses, pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel and taking your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go, behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Oreb and you shall strike the rock and water shall come out of it and the people shall drink. This is a really odd moment, isn't it? Grab the staff, Moses. Go over to the rock in front of the elders of Israel and I want you to strike it. I want you to think about what God is asking him to strike. This is Mount Horeb. This is like where Sinai is about to be in Exodus chapter 19. This is the place Moses first encountered God in Exodus chapter three in all of his holiness. And God said, take your sandals off. The place you are standing is holy ground. And God just said, strike it with your staff. Would you think that was okay? This is the place in chapter 19 that God will descend and wrap fire and thick smoke around the mountain and come and thunder and lightning and speak in a way so much that the people are terrified at first of his presence and said, if anyone goes near the mountain, they will die. Strike that mountain where the presence of God is. With what? Look at what it says. The staff with which you struck the Nile. What has this staff been used for the entire book of Exodus? What is striking the Nile an act of? It's an act of judgment. He has used this staff again and again as an instrument and display of his judgment and his power. He struck the Nile, it turned to blood, it showed this ominous death that was coming. He took the staff and it was through the staff that the God displayed his power and he split the Red Sea and he brought destruction and what? Judgment on the Egyptians. It's at the very end of this chapter that Moses will hold that staff up and God will bring what? Judgment on the Amalekites. And God has just told Moses to take this staff and strike where his presence is. I want you to read with me here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul says, I want you to, Not be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. Moses struck that mountain, outpoured what? Provision, outflowed life. And what is the story of the gospel? As the apostle Paul picks it up himself, we're not making this stuff up. The apostle Paul says, this was all a picture of our Lord who would be what? Struck for us. Who would be struck, who would die, who would be crucified in order that what? Anyone who comes to him could have the living water that he supplies. What is the provision? It's him. It's not what we can get. It's who we get. The provision is the provider. The provision is Jesus. He said in John 6, I'm the bread of life. If anyone eats and anyone hungers, he can come to me and he will never hunger again. He will never thirst again. He told that woman at the well, the water I've got is gonna spring up into a well of eternal life and you shall never be thirsty again. What is the provision? The provision is the Lord. He is the rock of ages. He is the bread of life. He is Jehovah Rapha. He is the Lord and God, and he will not let you lack. Those who trust in the Lord lack no good thing. You need him. You think maybe you need a lot of things right now in your distress, but who you really need is him. Some of you need him for forgiveness. You need that living water because you need to be forgiven of your sin. And it's only through the striking of Christ that happens. It's only through the judgment that fell upon Jesus and his resurrection that you can have that living water. But the Bible says, all who are thirsty, come and drink without price. He wants to give you himself. But Moses names the place Masa and Meribah because the way the text ends is, is they ask, is the Lord among us or not? That's not the question you wanna be asking because the Lord Jesus has come. He's given you his spirit and in every single moment, he desires to sustain you, to make you holy, to refine you. Will you trust him? Would you pray with me?
Father, I pray that we would know that you are trustworthy, that you love us as a father. You are our father and you have displayed it the most in the giving of your son, Jesus. We have everything, Jesus, we need in you. Lord Jesus, I love you. Jesus, thank you. Jesus, you are savior. You are Lord. You are our healer and you can make what is bitter sweet. Lord, I pray you bring healing in this room to hearts today that we would simply see you. And I pray, Jesus, in your name, amen.